All right. So we'll start out with something that seems sort of non-controversial, but really like what classification we use, what we accept does have controversy. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and give you a little historical perspective. How do we got to where we are with thoric lumbar classification? I really believe we've reached a point where we have a good solid classification that works. And because it has some numbers and letters at its basis, sometimes, you know, people get overwhelmed with that. But if, if you understand, it's actually a very, very simple classification and is pretty effective in guiding treatment. So why even classify? Uh, I think we want to be able to communicate with one another. And I, and I think in the end, you'll see this classification does it. So it has to be simple and it has to be reliable. It has to be reproducible. And we'll never reach 100% agreement. Um, and our case example, I'll, I'll show you a little bit why that is. We should be able to use it in scientific study to compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges or apples to just fruit in general. And it should hopefully guide treatment. Is this operative or non-operative? It would be nice if we could get it to where we could guide specific treatment. And I think we can do that to some extent, okay? So, we'll, so if you look at different thoracolumbar fractures, this fracture is not the same as this. They're treated differently. They're called different things. It's not the same as this. And it's certainly not the same as that. And I'm going to go through those as we go through the talk, but we need to be able to communicate what these are. They're all thoracolumbar fractures, uh, but we need to be able to communicate what it is, and they're all treated differently. So we want to gain insight into the historical evolution, understand the, the current accepted classification, and maybe give you a little bit of an example. So this is a patient that's a 57-year-old male, small airplane crash. He's actually a physician. He and his brother, uh, one lives in Alabama, one in West Virginia, and at the Alabama-West Virginia Home and Away series, his brother flew up in a small plane to get him and take him back to Alabama, and they crashed, taken off. They both had the same fracture, by the way, exact, almost identical. One had a deficit, one didn't. Uh, so the, he had perineal paresthesias, poor rectal tone, some weakness in, in, his, in his feet and ankles. And you can see this fracture pattern. Okay. You can see the injury here, injury here, maybe a facet injury, maybe a little fracture in the spinous process. All right, so how are we gonna classify this? And so the, the simplest concept, what we wanna know about thoracolumbar fracture, are they stable or unstable? And that's not as simple as we'd like to think it is. I mean, there's chronic instability, there's acute instability, you know, the white and Punjabi classification that we all refer to where description of stability is pretty spot on, but it leaves a lot of room. It has a lot of vagary to, and it basically is based on, uh, is this fracture stable enough to resist progressive deformity, resist normal Recording deficit, and won't result in late incapacitating pain? So really those are our goals of treatment achieve stability, protect the nerves, and correct any alignment. And so do we have to do that or not? And this is really the substance of it, but how do we, how do we get uh, down into the weeds on this? So there's been a whole bunch of classifications over the years. I'm gonna touch on just a few of these. So if you go back all the way back to when we use just x-rays and tomograms, we used to talk about two columns, an anterior column, the vertebral bodies that resisted axial load, and a posterior tension band that resisted flexion. And we had sort of two columns. What I find interesting is, for the most part, we've come back to that, okay? And that was one of the original classifications. In, in the 1980s, with the advent of CT scan, things changed, and we could see these fractures better. No longer were we trying to see the fracture with tomograms, which Recording in progress. At. It was pretty challenging. And so suddenly we could see, and we realized that fracture through this middle column, or the posterior third of the body with retropulsion, was very important, and it distinguished this component of burst fractures. So this is when the dentist classification came about. And, and really, we started talking about four morphological types of fracture. Compression, burst, flexion, distraction, dislo and a dislocation. And we, we still use it. That's still useful today, and that's still often how we communicate with each other. 
in the 90s, we started, we were doing some anterior surgery for these. And then along came the Fixiter intern from AO, and we started using pedicle screws and short segment fixation for these fractures. And what we noticed is a lot of, the, a lot of them were breaking. So this classification, the reason this came about is in response to that. Who do we need to do anterior column support, and who can we just use posterior fixation on? And it's not used much anymore, but the concept is still important. You know, how stable is the front? Do I need to, to put something in to resist axial load? But that was the reason that came about. Also in the 90s, the AO classification, the original one came out. And I think this is why some people have reluctance to using the new AO classification, because this was so cumbersome it ended up with 53 different patterns, and you could have like an A1.345 apostrophe, and it was too much, like it was too detailed. We didn't need that kind of detail, and so it became very, the, the uh, inner and intra uh, observer reliability was very poor, unless you just worked through A, B, and C. So at the A, B, and C level, it had decent reliability. Um, but what these all lacked was a component of neurology, which is what we all know drives us. So what drives our decision is the morphological pattern that came out of the uh, Francis Dennis classification, but we all looked at the posterior ligament as complex to assess stability, and we all use neurology. And so the TLIX was developed to address that and address our decision making. And really it was a, it's a trauma severity score is what it is. And we all know that above four, we would do surgery, below four not. It still didn't answer the burst fracture with, without deficit and, and intact posterior ligament, but we, we don't have anything. That's a judgment call and still is, and I think always will be. I don't think we can make a classification that defines that. So this went a long way and including the things that we needed. So if we look at our patient, according to Francis, Dennis, this is a burst. By the AO, it would be a type B. You know, you could argue maybe it's just an A because it's mostly here. Is Are those posterior element things important? t -lix, it would at least be a burst, maybe indeterminate posterior ligament, but there was a cauda injury, it'd be a seven, okay? And we could run through it. So, if you called somebody and you said this is a seven, they don't know what you're talking about. And you can't use it to compare anything. You couldn't use it to compare a seven to another seven because the fracture pattern may be different. So what, what the new AO classification does is simplifies the old one and incorporates the T-Lex the, the components. So we have A, B, and C. A is still ability to resist axial load is lost. B is the ability to resist flexion is lost in the tension band. Literally going back to the two column concept and C are fracture dislocations. Translation, rotational injuries. A's are very simple. There's an A zero. Now this is kind of separate, but you have to put the tra isolated transverse process, spinous process fractures somewhere, even though they're not axial load injuries and so they're the A zeros. A1 is a compression fracture. It really doesn't matter whether it's superior or inferior. That makes no difference ever in our treatment or decision making. So they got rid of all the subgroups and it's just a compression fracture. A2 is what we call a pincer fracture. It has this coronal split. I'll show you why it was important to distinguish that particular axial load injury. And then A3 and four are burst fractures. A3 just involves the superior end plate a4, superior and inferior. And this may be important because it could be these A4s are better off with some anterior column support. Maybe this is the one you do anteriorly or front and back. You know, I don't know that we have that answer yet, but you know, there's a degree of stability between the two. If we look at B injuries, there are three types of very, very simple. B are the pure bony chance injuries, mostly just seen in kids. And these have to be distinguished because they can be treated non-operatively potentially. That's the only B injury that, that as a general rule can be treated non-op. B2s can have a combination of bone or ligament through the posture elements. And B3 are extension fractures that occur without translation or rotation. Okay, these are, you know, these rigid spines. In all honesty, this example is probably a C. 
because it's got translation, but it would be the, the non-displaced crack. If you have a B injury, you always classify it by the worst component. B injuries can have an A component. So if you have a burst fracture that destroyed the posterior ligamentous complex, that's a B2 injury, but it's a B2, and if it's a superior end plate burst, it would be an A3. So it would be a B2, A3. So you would know that's a burst fracture with destruction of the posterior ligaments. And then C's, it doesn't matter what type of C it is. If it has rotation, translation, fracture, dislocation, the concept of treatment is all the same. These are all operative. They're all multi-level posterior fixation. It really doesn't matter what type of C it is. You also can secondary, and they all have a B injury, but you can classify the A component. So you might say this is a C, again, with a burst. So maybe a burst that has a fracture dislocation component, and that may alter your treatment. Like this one, you may do anterior column reconstruction on potentially, but it's a C injury. So it's a C, it's a C. So they made it very simple. Then they included the neurology, which Telix did. Neuro intact. Remember, transient neurological injury. This is very important if somebody's legs were tingling at the scene and it went away. That means they dinged their cord or conus or roots, and then it resolved. That's more unstable than someone who didn't have anything ridiculous, incomplete, complete. And if we can't determine the neurostatus because of head injury intubation, we just say NX. Only two modifiers. One modifier is for this, this group of people who you can't tell if the posterior tension bands disrupted. This is what gave us the TLIX fours. And so sometimes it's hard to tell, and, and, and you put an M1 modifier. That really al almost only ends up applying to burst fractures. And M2 are other patient-specific issues that will alter your treatment. Patient has burns, pulmonary injury, you know, things that will alter your treatment. So a little vague. So if we go back to those four in the beginning, this is an A2 injury. This is a pincer fracture. And the, the problem with this fracture is that this corner likes to settle into the fracture. And so what happens is, is initially it looks okay. At two weeks, it's collapsed down in. On, on occasion, you can treat these non-operatively, but you better watch them closely because they collapse into kyphosis. A lot of these we end up operating on. This fracture is, is an A4 burst, superior inferior end plate. This fracture is a B1. This is, the, this is a pure B1. This is a chance fracture. This fracture is unique because it can be treated either non-operatively, okay, cast and extension, three-month follow-up. You can't even tell that kid had a fracture. We often do those percutaneously now, but you can treat that in a cast or brace. That's the injury associated with abdominal things. So this is another one that we did with perk screws. Last one was a cast. So it it's, deserves a unique classification. And the C injuries, those get multi-level posterior fixation, like this mountain bike racer uh, who had this fracture dislocation. So our case, if we come back to finish up, we have this 57-year-old male with weakness. It's an L1 level injury. It's probably a B2 because of the facet fractures, if you remember, and the disruption here. It's got an A3 component, superior end plate burst. The neuro injury is an N3 because it's got a, a, a conus level injury. And then at L2, there's also an A1 fracture or a simple compression. So if you understand that classification, and I said this to you, you know, it seems daunting, but I would have an exact vision in my head of what that fracture looks like and I can decide treatment. So we know we have to achieve stability posterior due to the B2. B2 drives you posteriorly as a general rule. We may or may not need anterior column support. It's an A3, and we need to do something to decompress the canal because of the neurological injury, whatever that is. So I think it does drive treatment. This patient was treated with a multi-level posterior and a, and a transpredicular decompression. So uh, I think the classification is based on fracture morphology, posterior ligamentous complex, neurological status. We can use it to communicate. We can compare similar fractures in study now. We can compare all A3s. We can compare A3s to A4s. 
it helps determine treatment. And I, I really think this latest evolution is here to stay. It answers all those questions for us. And I think it's going to be hard to top it. Thank you. Stay, stay up there, John, for one question, then we'll have Dr. Kirkwood come up next. I know we're a little bit late, so just yeah. one question okay. right now, then we'll the debate uh, face some more. So last night we showed cases, and uh, there was a hyperextension factor shown. Yeah. I think most of us older people who were yeah. part of this, and yeah. I want to recognize your incredible work yeah. over a decade in the classification yeah. committee around the world. Um, but the interpretation was made by a younger trainee yeah. uh, that this was a three-column injury. Now, yeah. this three-column concept is one of the most absurd vestiges of conceptual yeah. uh, classifications yeah. that I know of because the actual classification is very sophisticated. Yeah. But w is there a reason to still have a three-column uh, theory floating around? Yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I never talk in that language anymore. Um, that fracture was an extension fracture, and almost all extension fractures through ankylospine are three column injuries, but there are some that just crack and, and you can't really find the exit point in the back. Those are probably the B3s. Most of them are C injuries, but the concept of three columns is probably unnecessary now. We should talk about ability to resist axial load and re ability to resist flexion deformity. Can I just go back to the concept, of, and Kirk, if I'm going to cut up your talk, let, tell me to shut up. Yeah. So the concept of three-column injury came from Denis, yes. and it came from when CAT scans the, came the out. Right. So CAT scans came out, and people said, okay, three-column injury, it's yeah. unstable. Yeah. That has never been proven, and the concept of they have a three-column injury, they need to get surgery, is yeah. completely incorrect. Yes. And the third part is the concept of three-column injury in the cervical spine is completely inappropriate. Yeah, I think if you notice, there was a McAfee classification that followed the knee, and in that classification, they, they attempted to sort out the stable and unstable bursts. Basically, they were trying to figure out which bursts probably were type B injuries in reality, uh, but it was an attempt to parse out that component, because the, the idea of a burst fracture, which ones we need to fix and don't fix, we're still struggling with, we struggled with then, and we'll struggle into eternity, I suspect. Thank you for this clear lecture.